Hello and welcome to Integrated Rhythm. Two swing dancing besties, that's Chisomo Salamani and myself, Bobby White, navigating race and the black experience in jazz dancing and especially swing dancing. Welcome to season two. It's been a long time coming, uh, but we think you'll understand why uh, we haven't been able to get, for instance, this introduction episode out to you any sooner. It's been a uh, kind of a rough time here in integrated rhythm land. But we'll talk about that in a second. First, we're going to talk about what today's episode is. It's a very it's a it's a great episode. We're very excited about it. It's uh, it's kind of amazing. We basically got five smart and funny black women into a room to listen to the smart and funny black woman Norma Miller's comedy album from the 1970s. And we discussed uh, everything about it we could think of. And it's, it's a ton of fun. Also, there are a ton of content warnings I could give you. There are so many content warnings for this because Norma Miller was, as we mentioned, a 1970s comedian. And in the 1970s, a lot of things were safe to discuss in comedy, relatively safe to discuss in comedy. And so this, you're going to hear bad language. You're going to hear racial, racially charged language. You're going to hear um, jokes about sex and sexual assault even. Uh, in these next two episodes, we can't stress enough the amount of content warnings that we could give you. I'm probably missing a few, so just please assume that it kind of applies. If there's any subject that you're uncomfortable with, uh, it, it might be a good idea to skip this one. Uh, or if there's young people about, or if there's anyone around here around you, this is definitely a not safe for work, and probably not safe for a lot of different people to be around you while you listen to this one. This is probably a headphones episode. That said, we, so many things that we do in this episode is is put Norma's comedy in context. We strive to put it in context. We strive to give the comedy itself kind of a safe space so that we could discuss Norma, discuss her time, discuss comedy in general, discuss the nature of comedy, how things were funny then, whereas now they would need to be said differently or the, we, we experience jokes differently, how maybe some things we should have never made jokes about, all that sort of stuff. It's a lot to, it's a lot to go through and it was such a fun and amazing conversation. All right, the other in really important thing about this episode, aside from its in great content overall, is that uh, one of our guests here in this episode is the one and only Michelle Stokes. As many of you in the scene know, Michelle Stokes passed away unexpectedly here early in 2022. And uh, she was part of the Integrated Rhythm family. She was in all of our party episodes. She had an incredible two-part uh, episode where we interviewed her and she helped perform the music with Laurel Ryan. This is the music that you hear in our theme music all the time. And so we can't uh, say enough about how how sad and beside ourselves we are with Michelle Stokes passing. But we are, we do feel thankful that we had one last chance to spend with her and that you get to be a part of that. That you get to hear Michelle Stokes be amazingly smart and and witty. And so without further ado, here is our Integrated Rhythm Season 2 episode, Healthy, Sexless, and Single, Norma Miller. Integrated Rhythm with Chisomo and Bobby. Ah, one more thing. In this episode, we would play one of Norma Miller's stand-up jokes, and then we would all talk about it. As you'll hear, at the end of the first episode, we got through one joke. To make this episode a little bit more exciting for you, we've gone back and added in more of Norma's jokes throughout the episode. So if you hear Norma's joke with a drum beat behind it, that is a fill-in joke that we hope will kind of like, you know, plays to what's being talked about in the conversation. However, the guests and hosts have not heard that joke at that time, and so they're not talking specifically about that joke. All right. Here we go. Welcome everyone to Integrated Rhythm. This is a very, very, very special episode. We are here with Andrea Gordon. We are here with Julia Loving. We're here with Michelle Stokes and we're here with 
Laurel Ryan. <laughs> and of course, Tosomo, Shar Shar, four pages. And of course, Tosomo, yes, co star. Woo! <laughs> so if you don't know, Norma Miller had a career in stand up comedy. Do any of y'all, do any of our guests know anything about her comedy life? Does any, any kind of fun facts that you want to share or anything that you heard? I was just going to say that just being a fan of watching Sanford and Son, you know, just some of the funniest skits have been with her actually not even saying anything, just showing up at the door of Fred Sanford as his best friend, Grady's girlfriend, and her just standing there. It just was just funny, just off the bat. I didn't realize she was on Sanford and Son. I mean, I knew that she had connected with like Red Fox and uh, a lot of the other really groundbreaking stand-ups of that era and that her comedy was honed by some of the, like by rubbing shoulders with some of the greats. I think it was at a, maybe a Lindy Fest where she performed, it was like, I'm sure there's an actual musical term for this, but it was like a comedy, not a song or a rap. It was a comedy sing song. Ooh. And it's been like, this lady's funny. But that was before I knew anything about her. You know how you, you meet someone in like two different contexts and it takes you a minute before you realize they're the same person? And so just you saying right now that she was on Sanford and Son, my brain was just like, fireworks like when did I and, and then Susan said it I was like oh my gosh holy cow I knew Norma Miller as that character before I started dancing and I was like how is that even even possible to have not realized it was like the same person but to to in this moment be like holy cow she was a comedian to me before she was a dancer and I didn't realize it's just really I don't know that, that moment was very exciting. So thank you for sharing that tidbit. And I, I would say that my, my full experience with Nora's comedy really has been just her having conversations with people. And it's a different, you know, totally different thing, people who are conversationally funny versus people who are, are great stand-ups. So this is really exciting for me to actually hear her stand-up. But people who are conversationally funny are just, like, they're such magnets to be around a person who is just, like, telling you things and just by their pace or, you know, a look or whatever, they can just have you in stitches, no matter how terrible the medicine tastes. <laughs> you know, sometimes you said some things that are wild, but those moments, like you just can't pass up those moments to be around a person who's just like at her core, completely hilarious. So that was, that's my full experience with Norma's comedy at this point. For those of you who are listening to the podcast, you won't be able to see this, but you can easily find it on YouTube. Just YouTube Norma Miller, Sanford and Sons. But we're going to watch that right now. This is a little, qu quick little scene. Now, there they are now. Now, don't go spoiling it for Grady, all right? I ain't gonna spoil you. You, you, you have to try to raise me. You, my problem. kid. I raise right, you. Tell me what you what I'm trying to tell you. I know how to handle it. All right. Oh. Grady. Hey, well, here I am with the girl of my dreams. Now get ready to meet my little dog. Okay, now close your eyes. <laughs> and here she is. <laughs> this, this, is, this is Dolly Simpson, my Dolly. Dolly, honey. This is my best friend, Fred, and that's his loving son, Lamar. So very glad to meet you. Oh, I see you do laundry. <laughs> uh, uh, it's it's uh, awfully nice meeting you, Miss Dolly. Grady's told us so much about you, uh, uh, and Pop and I wish you the best in your new marriage, don't we, Pop? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you, thank you. Fred, Fred's gonna be the best man at the wedding, huh? Yeah, well, I'd like to stay and chat with you, but I gotta be running off. Miss Dolly, it was nice meeting you, and again, best wishes. Oh, thank you. Grady, why don't you and Dolly sit over here on the couch, and I'll be right back as soon as I say goodbye to Lamont. <laughs> I did a little dove. <laughs> 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 
He don't know a dove from a buzzer. Ah, you ever see anything ugly that you like? I mean, rude to the lady, rude, but the styling was, mwah. you can see that this comedy is used in all of the other shows that people tend to like, like your Living Single, your Martin, your, like, this is <laughs> that. And the wig with Spi Bang <laughs> just, like, pulled so far back, so far back. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> This is maybe 100% the most, like, normal I've ever seen Norma. <laughs> and still had right? me dying. Like, she was, like, pretending to be a normal person and had me laughing. <laughs> right. I was like, this don't fit. This don't not fit. Norma Miller at all. Oscar-worthy performance. Like, yeah. That wig. I, it's, was that wig on backwards? <laughs> like, what? <laughs> What's what, where was her hairline trying to start? Because it came in like behind the track a lot. And, and so she did so little and said so little, but just like her sort of mannerism of like not realizing that she was the joke was entirely the joke. That was a fun clip because it was like the reduction of, of everything that is Norma's like regular personality. And it's still like translated as really funny. And it's really true Red Fox with Norma. You know, that relationship shines through understanding that these two had a relationship, a comedic relationship, you know? And it made it so funny. I remember saying to Norma that, you know, it's funny, growing up, I watched Red Fox a lot. Most Black people would watch Red Fox, Stanford and Son for sure, right? And I said, I didn't know you, but I knew that actual episode because it was so funny, you know? And it was like, these are precursors to some of these other black art shows, I mean, black shows, you know, black comedic shows. And, uh, and she said, you really remember? I said, it was just very funny, you know, but uh, I thought it was great. And it, just some of the things that Red Fox was able to say, just the snapping, this was like pure black humor. And um, people today would probably take offense to a lot of it and be like, oh, he's bashing a female. But this is black art. This is black comedic things that went on in our communities, things that we would do in our own households and snap on one another. And it was never like meant to make a person feel like, oh, you know, let me, let me cast them aside or let me just put them out there and me to them. You know, like it's it, it just something different. <laughs> you know? It was just meant to be funny. I've heard when it comes to her comedy, I've heard people say, oh, she, Red Fox mentored her. And Norma Miller said, no, I, I sat in the clubs and I watched him and Richard Pryor and stuff do comedy, but I did that work. Uh, Sorry, I don't get the sense of like a culture of mentorship in mm -hmm. comedy per se anyway, you know, yeah. uh, like we're like, oh, I got to train up somebody else to be funny. No, it's like, you're just trying to get out there and do your own stuff. But I would say probably particular with women too, because women were now starting to come up in comedy. So why would a guy take them under their wing? It wouldn't happen, I feel like. And it's very reminiscent of how I feel like dancing was learned as well. Like no one's, you know yep. what I mean? Watching somebody, you put your own style on it. Maybe somebody might be like, come over here and I'll mentor you. Maybe, but nah. Well, I mean, if they could potentially profit, <laughs> perhaps. Yeah. That's, you know, in my personal experience with, trying to start in comedy. It's been sort of mixed, but I've had a lot of experiences where people felt threatened by like the reaction of an audience. Like, how long have you been doing this? But then there's another side of that where people are like, well, I'm trying to get on a certain stage and, you know, I'm looking for a person who fits several demographics, <laughs> you know? So do you want to come and, and do this show with me? So I'm getting a little bit of that too. And there's some people who are actually genuine perhaps, but I felt the same way when I was dancing where it's like people were not bringing me along because, you know, I was eager and I was doing all of the things, you know, people were bringing me along because 
I was a Frankie Manning ambassador or because I was, you know, whatever. And it made me really like sort of skeptical about a lot of those kinds of relationships in dance for the same reasons. But if you, that goes all the way back, right? Because Whitey's Lindy Hoppers, they didn't become big because they were these phenomenal, wonderful dancers. It's because they were more interesting than what was happening inside the ballrooms, right? It's just the ones who's trying to make money off of how great they were, you know? So it's interesting that way that like, we're not fostering these, these environments where mentorship is, is the norm or fostering environments where it's like, can I make money off of you is the norm. I couldn't help also thinking about Moms Mabley having an influence on Norma at that time too, because Moms Mabley, you know, some of the things that would come out of her mouth at that time period was like, whoa. So she was around a lot of these black comedians that certainly, I, I, I'm not gonna say mentor, but maybe you are, you, you're saying not mentors, but you know, sometimes mentorship doesn't necessarily have to be where people do hands-on, but you're learning from them. And yeah, you know, yeah so definitely the influencing, influencing. Well, I, I think that this goes to like how we learn a lot in black communities, like situated yes. learning, right? We put ourselves yes. in situations and then we learn. And as we get better, then the community encourages that, right? It's like, hey, you're awesome. So keep doing this, right? So Andrea actually does comedy. Do you mind talking a little bit about that before we dive into Norma's stand-up? It's a fairly, fairly new hobby, but you know, in the last couple of years, we, we all had a little extra time on our hands, no reason in particular. So I sat at home and I watched a lot of comedy to like relieve the sort of weight of all of this. And then I, you know, through Zoom shows and that sort of thing, met some comedians and they really sort of encouraged me to try. I think some of them wanted me to fall on my face, but it doesn't matter. And so rather than finding an opportunity to do open an open mic via Zoom or something, I just created my own open mic show. So I produce an open mic show and it's a, it's called Hand Up Comedy Open Mic Show. I do it once a month and I have a couple of working LA comedians give feedback to first time comedians. So they get to try comedy on Zoom and then, or a set of real comedians help them figure out how to rewrite a joke or how to pace themselves well, or this gives them some ideas um, about how to do that properly. So I hosted the show. I had to fill in for a comic. So I did my first set on my own show. And then I started doing open mics in Orange County and LA in the last couple of months. And so we're out here, I guess. It's been fun. I've been able to do a couple of different shows and a lot of different kinds of stages, burlesque stages, stuff where I kept all my damn clothes on. And that's what it's been so far. It's been great. So Andrea was talking about how Norma Miller is conversationally funny. Andrea is conversationally <laughs> funny. She is hilarious. Like, listen to any story she tells you. The pacing is amazing. She's so funny. So, Well, thank you so much. I do try. I think I've only told you stories about horrible dating experiences, and those are just naturally those are the best funny. kind. Always funny. Always, always funny. funny. Yeah. All right, so before we listen to Norma's stand-up album, I'm just going to show everyone here the cover. And uh, let's see, Michelle and Laurel, if you would describe what you see on the cover for those listening on their podcasts. Oh, okay. All right. So we are seeing <clears throat> healthy, sexless, and single Norma, Norma Miller. Miller. And, oh, sorry, Let's let's read it properly. Oh, okay. Psst. You're just healthy, sexless. Oh, sexless and single. Norma, Norma Miller. Miller. My life. It seems like. Uh, mirror, mirror. What's the hex? It's still Snow White. And where is sex? Also me. I guess that. No, says Norma Miller. So okay. So we've got a we've got Snow White, Norma Miller in a fabulous. Mary J. Blige, shake and go, blonde wig. Like a bouncy bob with a sleeveless, I mean, she's looking into the distance, questioning a, a mirror, but there is a man holding the mirror who does not seem to be into this, also wearing a fantastic suit with the cuffs rolled over the, the jacket because the 70s, I'm uh, guessing. And he's wincing? Like, he's like, ah. Well, I mean, he is the mirror. Oh, he's the mirror. Okay. You know, 
Yeah, I mean, yeah. he's he is speaking the title. I get it. I get it. So, I, get it. I mean, I like it. Rejection from the. I like the this. man as a graphic designer. This graphically checks out. So <laughs> essentially, <laughs> that's where the expertise comes in. So essentially, we've got a, a fabulous woman wondering why she's still single, and if that ain't life, you know. Mm -hmm. Say that because you have a boyfriend. If that ain't life, don't put me on blast like that. Okay. Me on blast. It's too late. We gonna mute this and we gonna talk about it. All right. So we're gonna listen to the first track from Norma's stand-up album. It's called Instincts. I'm not gonna say some of these titles, by the way, because I don't want to say them and you don't want to hear me say them. But here is track number one. Instincts. Right now, ladies and gentlemen, the very fabulous Miss Funny Lady, the very lovely socket to my soul sister, Miss Norma Miller! <laughs> Oh, yeah. You heard the story about the two chicks standing at the bar and one chick said to the other one, she said, my instincts tell me I ain't gonna make no money tonight at all. The other broad said, honey, my instincts too, but I'm sure gonna try like hell. Strong opening. Solid. It's like out the gate. Like that kind of energy is like, it's aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> she had like, 20 different euphemisms for being the blackest person she can imagine being. <laughs> Dying. But when she said, used to be Negro, can't remember when I was colored, I was like, come on, girl. Like, like, oh. oh my gosh. So many phases of blackness. I, I enjoyed that. That was great. <laughs> it starts off, sock it to me. And that was really something that was prevalent, you know, that was something that was said a lot when people would introduce comedians and go, sock it to me, sock it to me. It's just a big, you know, and she did sock it to me in a, like a matter of seconds, right? <laughs> and then, then to bring up, oh, the instincts and standing on the street corner, I'm going to make some money, right? Yeah. Just, yes. Just definitely some, you know, like something that you probably wouldn't hear because people are worried about what other, what people are saying to that and forgetting that it's comedy. You know, mm -hmm. the getting that is meant for comedy and, you know, is it safe to say things like that today? Like, is it safe? I'm going to ask you, Andrea. Or is it oh, yes. safe? <laughs> is, I'm just saying, like, you know, is everybody's ready to cancel everyone for make, especially com comedians. And, you know, is it safe to say things like that? Is it safe to, you know, laugh at ourselves in our own culture or even, you know, laugh at others? And I'm going to say snap on other cultures and other people. It's definitely um, a thing where you have to watch, you know, who is your audience? Because when I do shows in Orange County, there's certain things I can't do in LA. Mm -hmm. And there's also like, who, who is my audience? Like when she says something like, I'm standing on the corner and I instinct say that I'm not going to make any money, but the next person says, uh, my instinct say the same thing, but I'm going to try like hell. That's an experience that some people have and other people don't. So that Orange County audience is going to be like, like, what does that, like, what does that mean? If you don't make money, you move on to another corner where my, you know, whatever. But people, you know, if you're speaking to the correct audience to like a, where culturally they understand struggle, like, because that's what the joke is. The joke is struggle. That audience is going to be like, yep, that's me. Like, she knows what she's talking about. And, and they're the ones who are going to be engaged and laugh. So there's so much of this that's like, do I laugh because I'm uncomfortable and I don't get it? There's that like shy kind of like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know. But there's also that laugh of like knowing. That laugh of knowing is going to come with some audiences and not others. So it's just, where are you right now looking around? I told a joke once about being in Orange County. I was in Huntington Beach. And I said that, you know, this is my first time doing stand-up because it was. 
And I said, you know, I hope I don't die up here. Better yet, I hope I don't die in the parking lot because <laughs> they're killing people in these streets. Mm -hmm. You know, Huntington Beach is not a place that I want to hang out, but it's the only place that was open. They did not love that joke. But all of you were like, uh, yeah, <laughs> I got to. Yeah, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. We find yes. it very funny. Yes. There you yes. go. It's your audience. So yeah. it's safe to yeah. tell any joke as long as you're in the room with like like minded people, you know? Also it also seems like the 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 crux of the joke is about either a struggle or like it's about an experience, right? And I think sometimes comedians do a butt of a joke about people as a whole. And that can be, that can be something that's not great. Yeah. Right? Also, right. Like, it's just chicks standing on the corner. Now, culturally speaking. I, I know what that means. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, you assume that that's, uh, that's sex work, but like, not necessarily. Like, maybe they're busking. I don't know. Like, you know, that can, <laughs> it's, it's the kind of, it's a mm -hmm. kind of joke that like, you're, like, you're saying, it's like the audience is going to interpret it in right. a particular way because of like culture and context and so yeah like that that first right there timeless it has to be funny like if you're saying something and it's not funny and somebody's the butt of the joke then of course people are gonna be like then cancel just, turns out you're just mean <laughs> you're just the mean right. and i think a lot of comedians nowadays think they're funny when actually they're mean that's yep. what i think and so yep. And so they're like, I don't know why people aren't laughing. Or they're doing a stand-up comedy routine. They say a joke. People are like, oh. And they're like, don't, ah, uh, laugh at that. You're like, oh, it was funny. And on top of that, it was really rude and mean. So I think if you're going to say something controversial, because comedians are supposed to give you, like, that, that sugar with the medicine, when you're going to say something controversial, it needs to be funny. But I also feel like the base of the joke should be about the struggle or the perception, not about necessarily the people it talks about. I yes, I agree. I agree. I also think that like in that joke, like it's, it's easier to tell a joke when the joke is on the person telling it. Yes. Right. And when the joke is on me and you identify because you're just like me, then it's not even me making fun of myself. It's me making fun of us. Yes. And then it's a shared moment where it's like, oh, I like that comedian. I identify with that comedian. He makes, he pokes fun at me while poking folk at him or, or her so it's it's also like who are we together and every once in a while you can like poke fun at someone who is other but you have to make sure that you bring that person in like that person has to be like on the same page like we're about to make fun of you now you're not like me and we're gonna make fun of you and that almost that that can be so it's it can be so like risky if you can't, if you, if that person isn't really with you, and the only way that you can get out of that when you've crossed a line is if you have enough other people in the room who are like you, <laughs> who save you from that situation that you can pull back. But almost always, you got to go right back at your own self. Like, you have to be like, you're like this, but then I'm like this. Can I ask, I don't know if this is generational because I'm a little bit probably older than you all, but for me, it's a little different. Because I've, you know, I've always taken comedy as exactly that, as comedy. And having grown up with all types of different comedy from different, you know, perspectives and all of that, I've always taken it as, as more of just a comedian doing comedian work, you know. So I, I don't know. It, it could, you know, things today have been politically corrected. Things today have been canceled cultured. All of these different things have, have come about, but a lot of the, you know, comedians today, I don't know, I mean, uh, the past probably would, probably would have been censored today. Think ones that were brilliant, you know, thinkers and br brilliant in their stand-up and, and all of that would have been canceled. So would we have missed out on some of that, that funniness, like the raw funniness of things just to be funny, not to, to be socially impactful, you know? So I'm just, just as a devil's advocate from, from a, a person that has generational experiences with comedy, you know, just from a different time period where certain things I, I would watch on television in the past probably, and it, would, it was so funny at the time, like even looking at like Archie Bunker and things like that, they probably wouldn't be shown today, but they were real funny nonetheless. 
So I'm just wondering, even like this skit here, you know, thinking about, you know, her speaking about someone on the corner, I'm going to make my money anyway. Like, would that have been something that today someone would say, oh, it's OK to, to play that? Probably not. You know, but back then and for the audience that she played for and the community that she played for, probably was majority African-American, you know, in a black community, that would have been hell, hella fine funny, you know, but you couldn't maybe possibly play that somewhere else today. You know, so I'm, I'm just, you know, looking at different spins on generationally funny and generationally in comparison to today where things are just sure. like, oh, no, but we can't make fun of that. Chick was doing so bad, ain't had a trick all day. She met this cat. So the guy said, well, look, how about $100 if you do it my way? And she'll do anything for this $100. So she goes with the guy to the hotel room. She said, for $100, damn, there ain't nothing he could want that she can't do. So she takes off all her clothes and everything, and they get ready to make it and everything. She said, all right, what's your way? He said, on credit. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I do think that there's there's an element of, there's a comedy that, like, part of the reason why it is funny is because of the, the culture and context at the time. Like, you know, I mean, like, especially pop culture jokes, you know, pop culture changes. So, you know, watching some of the comedic routines from, like, 1930s and 40s. I grew up watching Marx Brothers movies, and so there was a lot of pop culture references that completely went over my head. But the way that it was said was funny. And like, there was a lot of the kind of vaudevillian like slapstick in there. So there was enough that like, it was still funny to me, even as a, you know, 10 year old watching these, you know, four, three or two brothers just like riff on the, the things at the time. I just like a lot of the comedians, you know, had they continued performing, you know, let's say they lived a thousand years, you know, they would, they just adapt because part of what they did was speak to the, the culture and use the language of the time. And so, you know, for, I think it was uh, Cat Williams who said something to the effect of a lot of the comedians who are complaining about getting canceled now, they just haven't adapted. And if you're, if you're good at the job of comedy, then you'll be able to be adapt because yeah. what you're doing is you're finding ways to be funny in the time and space that you're in. And it's like, cause culture's always, it's going to keep changing. Yeah. So I also think too, a lot of the eighties and nineties comedy, I feel like, cause I, I used to love watching comic view. I used to love watching Sinbad, <laughs> Sinbad Eddie Murphy's rock, like all these things like we would have in the house that I wasn't supposed to be watching at seven, eight and nine, but it's like their jokes were based off of, I feel like communities that they necessarily didn't know about. Like sometimes it, the butt of the joke was about the people, but the people, they don't know about the people and the observations within that thing. But the more, culture has shifted, you start to learn more about maybe some of the butts of those jokes and the people who are involved. And so then the joke needs to change because now there's like a human, a human element added to it. It like certain controversies can still be funny, but now you got to hit it at a different angle. You can't just be like, oh, blackity black people. They're so black. They're so dark. You can't see them. Like maybe back in the day that could have been funny. Cause like, oh yeah, yeah, black people are dark. But now you're like, why are you saying that? <laughs> and there's other jokes you could make, and you should make your jokes yeah. in adjust now, Yeah, now the butt of the joke is, like, the system that uh, created the, you know, the, like, the little hand washy things that don't register dark skin. Like, the, the, the butt of the joke is different. The commentary is still, like, the dark, same. Dark. dark skin exists. Yeah. But, gotcha. uh, yeah. yeah. Like, I yeah. think it's just about finding ways to make, make similar points, but with yeah, because even the, even the joke about standing on the corner, I still think can apply and be funny because they're not making fun of the actual sex workers. Yeah. They're making fun of the struggle itself. Yeah. But I feel like old jokes would have been like, ah, oh, those prostitutes, they're prostituting. They're bad. <laughs> 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 it's funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The prostitute or being a sex worker. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. I think that's why this joke, like, the very, we haven't even got past it. Like we've made 
she's made two jokes. <laughs> One, the language around blackness is constantly changing, okay. still applies. Two, you know, sometimes even if, uh, regardless of the work you're doing, sometimes it's about perspective, still applies. So like, it already still works. Timeless. Yeah. Starting off great. I can't wait till she starts talking about stuff that isn't. <laughs> right, right. And, and I guess that that's really the, the point I, I was trying to say, like, are, are things applicable that can stand the test of time? And is that true comedy? Or is it something that, like you said, the adaptability is important? You know, certainly. Yeah, we're not, we're not going to get get Norma canceled postmortem doing this, are we? So, uh, that, yes. No matter what <laughs> horrible thing she says, we're yes. still all on board, right? So, yes. Everybody's uptight today. Like the ever white cat went to the bar, he asked for a jig of rye. When he looked and saw the spook bartender, he said, I mean a jig roll. <laughs> so there was this swing dance camp, and they often had Norma Miller, and she did some of her stand-up stuff at one point. And I didn't see the stand-up. What I saw was someone walking out of there with really big eyes saying, I didn't realize that that was going to happen because they had seen Norma Miller, the swing dance instructor, not Norma Miller, specifically the 1970s comedian. It's so important when I, when I tell people about Norma's comedy, I'm like, she was a 1970s comedian as a way of explaining that if you know about 1970s comedy, you wouldn't necessarily be surprised at all by, by her comedy, right? Very Orange County, it sounds like. <laughs> I mean, like, there are so many comedians out right now who are sort of like, I'm not gonna, like, soft, you know, who just like soft, mellow tones, who say things that are not very offensive or whatever. And that's such a departure from like the priors and the, like, people who told some bit of truth about their life that morning that could make you laugh, but also made you just like grasp your like pearls and like it's just it's such a different <laughs> lifestyle like the the joke about pouring cereal for my kids versus like the joke about not being able to afford cereal for my kids is it's a very different kind of like delivery it's a very different like volume so I can imagine that like telling 1970s jokes or or humor or method in 2003 is not going to go over well <laughs> Do you think those are jokes of privilege, like the people with the soft tones? Like, I can't talk about this struggle, so I'm going to talk about pouring this cereal and how the box tabs don't keep your cereal fresh. Well, I mean, like, you know, more more comedians now have, like, money. Like, I, I listen to Tiffany Haddish tell jokes, and her jokes are about keeping her cereal fresh because she can afford cereal. So I think a lot of it is just where that particular person is, and they fit in a different part of the culture than another person who maybe has, like, already gotten there. If you look at Kevin Hart's first special cool. compared to his current special, look at Dave Chappelle. Like Dave Chappelle doesn't even have to be funny anymore. <laughs> like, um, <laughs> even, and that comes more from what was it like to live in the 70s as like a as a black comedian than it would have come from like what was it like to live now. Like the stages were very different. Like Dick Gregory, like, was not just a comedian, he was a civil rights activist. Like, who you had to be as a comedian back then is different than people who are comedians now and what their involvement with, like, the struggle or the community is economically or Playing socially. Racially, economically, and socially integrated audiences, I think, is is a very modern thing for comedians like in all likelihood you weren't gonna have that many people who didn't look like you in your earlier show like in shows in the 70s because segregation wasn't that far behind or over mm -hmm. so yeah of course you're gonna like you're you're gonna get away with saying some other stuff that would not play to a blended audience whatever that would mean and because like michelle was saying earlier like you wouldn't have interacted with as many people who didn't have similar experiences mm -hmm. then yeah. we also have a tendency like if we're thinking about the audiences that we would find in swing dance camps, especially thinking about the way that we perceive history, we have a tendency to sanitize the past. And so Norma Miller is nothing if she's not 
earnest about her life experience in at every stage, right? So it was 1970s comedy because that was her life. But the people that she was talking to, as you mentioned, were an audience that has a tendency to make that time period and all the other time periods that they're reflecting on seem golden and beautiful and kind of untainted. And so I think also to Julia's point, we need to understand like where we are and the different communities in which we live and the cultural elements associated with it. And you know the one about the little kid that's caught playing with himself and his mother tells him, she said, look, young man, you keep doing like that, you're going to go blind. So the son said, can I do it till I need glasses? <laughs> I actually wanted to submit this, and we can talk about this later, but just a cultural understanding of playing the dozens, right? So we were That's talking right. about like mm -hmm. when it's okay and when it's not okay to make fun of people, but there is this embedded cultural understanding, so much so that like I grew up, like I grew up in pain, y'all. I was a <laughs> fat kid in Black America and in a Black Africa, right? So <laughs> like absolutely, over. I understand just like <laughs> all over. Uh, yes, yes. Playing the dozens, snapping, and you know, you and, five. And, 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 like, I have black southern heritage. So, in the summertime, I would spend time with my brothers, and there's nothing but boys around. And I would be the brunt of all the jokes, you know, everything. But, you know, I, today they would say that I was being bullied, right? Mm. But at the same time, it taught me to have tough skin and be able to respond back as well. You know, so I don't know. It's just, I, I'm just thinking about all of these different modalities or, or variables with comedy. And, you know, who do we have to appease? And why do we have to appease? And why do we have to sanitize? And why, you know, like all of these different things come about, you know, when we're looking at what comes out of our mouths and our experiences. That Do we always have to sanitize to be politically correct so that someone else can be comfortable? <clears throat> You know, so I'm just, I'm just, th just thinking out loud. I'm not saying this is so. So I, I'm, I hear you, Chisomo, about you know, the, just, just playing the dozens. You know, <laughs> are we yeah, just playing the dozens? That's true. Can we, yeah, can we just it. play the dozens sometimes without yeah. having? to worry about being canceled for playing the dozens, you know. Right. And, and, and to give, actually, I, I would love to hear your definition of playing the dozens just in, place, just in case somebody doesn't know what it is. I also wanted to call back to what Andrea said. What I realized yeah. in my life is that the same people who ragged on me, the same people who played the dozens with me, those people also demonstrated their love for me. You know what I'm saying? So I, I think we we also need to remember the culture in its full context if we take something out of context and only talk about your mama jokes then, mm -hmm. <laughs> then we're only getting like a small glimpse but even people who aren't in the culture can understand your mama jokes like those are yes you know. so growing up in atlanta we would sit at the, the table at lunch table in elementary school and it was your mama jokes pretty much nonstop. And it was so funny in hindsight to see, because you would say your mama jokes and they would either hit or not. And you knew very quickly whether they did. And then there was the time when you got a little too personal. There's the time when your mama joke, all of a sudden it's the person physical. stopped laughing and was like, <laughs> oh. and you're like, I guess your mama <laughs> isn't very intelligent. <laughs> It's true. Listen, okay, so we had playing by the dozens at our house, right? Mm -hmm. And you'd be like two or three years old, learning how to walk, and they'd be making fun of you for wobbling. Oh, look at her, wobbling, just looking stupid. <laughs> you just get clowned on. So when you start to get older, you'd be like, wait a minute, does auntie so-and-so, do they actually like me? Because this whole time they've been saying, I got a big head, I look ugly. <laughs> and then you're right, it has to be balanced out by love. So... Yeah. Playing dozens can be a fun thing, and you can learn how to hit back, but you also got to make sure that the actual family member that you are getting played with actually likes you, because maybe there's controversy in the family you don't know about, and here you come, ah, look at you, look at dumb, you stupid dumb person. <laughs> You're like, dang, I'm like seven, leave me alone. She got kicked in the head really hard. <laughs> Alone. Or on the schoolyard, you're right. If it gets too personal, you'd be like, yeah, your mom is so dumb. She ran outside. They said it was chilly and she ran and got a ball. And then someone's like, ah, she's dumb. <laughs> like, 
Yeah. You just gotta yeah. know who you're playing with and what the rules are. Like, oh, tell my mom. But, but usually, <laughs> usually, usually it is in that kind of setting. You know, it's a yeah. communal or familial setting, right? This playing the dozens, right? It's between two contestants, right? And usually, and this is something in black communities throughout the United States, right? And they basically insult each other until one gives up, right? And it's customary for the dozens to be played like around an audience of, of bystanders. So if you're in a school, it'd be like your classmates or whatever, right? Or if you're at home, it'd be like family. Like usually it's when your, your family comes together, like your cousins are there. Usually it's a Saturday night party where your, your family is all there. And it's part of the family, right? And, and it just basically, it, it draws up this tension and then it goes down. But it's funny. A lot of it is just funny stuff. And it's not, you know, and then the next day you're still playing in your friends. So it, it's something that you usually would roll off, you know. Never seen it in action. I can recommend the pilot episode of the TV series, The Last OG. You'll see okay. it. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So my experience, at least in my mind, my experience with the dozens is less formal. And I think that every every Black community, I think, does some version of this. Like, if you grew up in the U.S., you probably know of, like, the dozens as, like, a game that's played. But I think that, like, my family being uh, Jamaican and, like, we have Trinidadian, we have, you know, Nambian, we have all of these different things. We all have a culture where our parents trained us to be tough because people will say things to us. Right. And my experience might be, like, I was a person who was perpetually ashy. I just always was and the way <laughs> the way that your family you know will teach you that this is important to moisturize is not to be like here baby here's some lotion for you it is to make fun of just how ashy you are and so my first instinct obviously would be like mom like so-and-so uncle tommy said this or whatever but then her response is going to be you're going to let him say that to you with that haircut and that many divorces. And so like she teaches you to play the game, but also as you're walking out, she's like, baby, get some lotion. <laughs> you know, like it's 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 about it's about how people train you to fight back and how and about how they train you in in their way. It's a loving way of being like, fix yourself, please. <laughs> like, fix yourself. So nothing formal about that, but that's just how like black families kind of communicate, I think. Yeah, I, I I can say this from like Zambia on the continent, whatever. One of my favorite moments of like a dozens moment in Africa was there was a <laughs> there was a person working for the Peace Corps in in like this remote part of Zambia, and for some reason they were going back and forth to somebody with 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 an indigenous Black Zambian, and this person said. Ah, you're so fat, you couldn't go to the moon. <laughs> so, like, I, <laughs> that lives in my mind rent free. <laughs> it just, <laughs> it just sits there. So, yeah. <laughs> it's, either, you know, it's either your mama jokes or just how fat you are. You know, it's just always those things. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes, yes, yes. Life in peace. <laughs> yes. Training, that's what it was. So it's training. In my family is an issue. But like we would have it in the family, but then no one would tell me how to like hit back. So then I was like, hmm. And then I would say something that I heard that I wasn't supposed to hear because I'm an only child. <laughs> and then you, uh oh. <laughs> you get back and the power dynamic is off at that point. You'd be like, yeah, that's why you got five divorces. And then you're like, oh, wait, I wasn't supposed to say that. So I never learned how to play the game because I always either said it too personal or, I, or I, it would be too personal to me. And the family yeah. never trained it. It was just like, ah, you suck. That's why your wife left your ways. <laughs> that, I, I think that's why Norma started off her joke with the black, 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 beautiful, black, this, black, you know, <laughs> because <laughs> so much of what our comedy is about is our ourselves, our blackness, our, and, and it's, it's never meant to do harm, but just acknowledge who we are as a people, mm -hmm. you know, and that we can laugh at each other because after all, if we can't have any laughter, that would probably be the only joy that we may have for that week is that laughter. Mm -hmm. 
you know, in comparison to what we might meet at the, at the office or, you know, we have to be able to have that kind of laughter and that joy. And often the comedians provided that for us. Yeah, I, I agree. Also, I feel like I just need to say this, like, yo, you know, I'm, Listeners, you know I'm body positive. Please don't cancel me for that joke. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Please don't, please don't come after exactly. me. I, look, look, I'm a plus I, size. I'm a plus size woman. <laughs> hey, I, I, I try to think of myself as a plus size model, and, and I, I definitely have been on my fair share of receiving it, re- receiving end of fat jokes. So just wanted to throw that out there. Well, see that, that's, a, that's a prime example of what I was saying about canceling things, you know? The concern is the, not the fun, the, the joke itself, but just the, the feeling that I can't just say that, you know, of course, no, we don't want to, you know, be on the bus and scream fire, no, right? But what I'm saying is if we can't laugh about just things, you know, I, I don't know. So I get you, I get no, you I- with the, the fat joke. I do get it, you know? And I think you're absolutely right. I mean, one of the, one of the whole reasons for doing this podcast is so that people can hear Norma Miller's joke, but also have the context so that it won't be taken in the wrong way. Yeah. Yeah. They won't walk out of the Lindy or whatever, Lindy Hop event and be shocked by it. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, I'm you offended. Know. Like, oh, and you should know that. Norma <laughs> probably wouldn't. Have, no, you know, Norma probably wouldn't have cared anyway. But you know, yeah, yeah, and, and you know, what I'm be, saying, and, is- and to be fair, like the 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 shock, the look of shock on their face was was you know New Englander liberal shock. It wasn't it wasn't a desire to cancel her. It was basically it looked like they had just witnessed something they were not realizing that they were going to witness, and they were processing it, and would be processing it for a while, <laughs> probably a while. Yeah, I'm sure they. I'm sure they did that at one of like the little talks that they sometimes do around like lunchtime or whatever. And like, that's some like after hours, late night stuff. You can't just like interrupt a person's day with reality. They, they just learn how to do a sugar push and you try to tell them about, you can't, you can't put that in, you can't sandwich a Norma Miller company in the middle of the day and then have them just go right back to, to quick stops. You can't do that. You can't just. Also to their credit, I do think it was like a late night thing. It was a late night. I do, oh, to baby, their credit, I think they set it up the best way they could. Maybe they need to talk it up. That was smarter because you are correct. I agree. <laughs> You'd be expected to go back to a sugar push. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that was our like. So we've done some 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 games and things in Lindy Hop context where it's like we're about we're gonna talk about some issues, but then we got to get people to dance afterwards. Oh yeah. We got to like make it light and fun, but also be like, black people are suffering. <laughs> How can you help? <laughs> Dear but wife. also you got to dance. <laughs> <laughs> and now welcome to the stage. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so awkward because you just have to, you got to it to be light enough to, for the audience, but also like, please talk about the great struggle that black people have like can do but make it fun for sure Ugh. yeah because so. you don't yeah. want anyone running back to their dorm rooms or wherever they are sulking for the rest of the night because they got to be back on that dance floor oh my goodness <laughs> they're like listen talk about racisms but make the racisms fun and, and, and chewable it's 15 minutes later we gotta do these finger wagon we gotta go back to the finger wagon we gotta yeah. okay we need a finger wag and some laughs so make it happen and we came up with a game show based in racisms but also made it fun we so, can't do that yeah. so yeah it's we can do it we can make racisms fun yeah again. that and that is comedy <laughs> That's how you do it. You, <laughs> you give them a little bit of truth. You make you make it fun. So you just make a little mid-event, you know, cookout. You bring them all into the cookout, and you explain some things, and you just you have a good time. Put on your slides, have a good time. Then you go back to the dancing. People won't even notice. They'll just come out enlightened. I like this. And yeah, we're gonna work it out. We'll 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 figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So that first joke took about 43 minutes. We are never making it through the whole album. 